So our next presentation is going to be uh, uh, about device removal by uh, Matt Arens. And uh, probably most of you have already heard about this. It's a new feature which has been uh, uh, in the works for several years. And we've been using the Delphix already for uh, several years as well. And it made to Linux uh, relatively recently, I believe. So Matt is going to give a good uh, uh, deep dive into uh, device removal and its internal functioning. So please welcome Matt. Thanks, everyone. So uh, yeah, as Pavel mentioned, um, some of you might know what device removal is, but I'm going to start by explaining uh, what is the point of this. So uh, what I'm talking about here with device removal is, uh, like for example, in this case, we have a pool with three top-level VDEVs, three mirrors. Each one is a mirror of two disks. And what I want to do is remove this whole mirror um, and I'm reducing the total amount of space in the storage pool. So this is in contrast to, uh, for example, uh, detach, where I have a mirror and I want to remove one side of the mirror. You, you've been able to do that since, since the beginning, um, but that doesn't actually reduce the total amount of space uh, in your pool. Um, it, it, it's specific to mirrors. So uh, what, what is the point of this? Like, why, why would you want to do this? Oh, sorry, before I continue on, I noticed that. This is not being rendered correctly. All right, it likes to render it differently, fine. Um, what is the point of this? Why would you want to do this? Um, well, when we were designing this feature at Delphix, this is back in 2012, maybe. Um, one of the main use cases, uh, which is uh, you know, coming from our field people was, well, what if customers over-provision? They, they add too much storage to their storage pool, or like they have a temporary project where they're like, oh, I need a bunch more storage just for like the next month while we do this project. And then after that, I want to, you know, remove this, re remove that space and use it for something else, you know, for a different storage pool or, or, or something else entirely. Um, <clears throat> has anybody had this problem? No. Wow. Oh, one person has over provisioned their pool. <clears throat> um, yeah, it, this turned out to not really be the, re the real use case. Um, another big use case is like if you add the wrong disk or, or add, it, add the VDIV as the wrong type, like you meant to add it as a log device, but you added it as a main, as like a regular device. It's kind of stuck in there forever. Um, don't worry, I won't ask if anybody has experienced this <laughs> use case. Um, but the, the main use case that uh, we've actually seen in practice is uh, for storage migration. So the idea here is like you want to mig you have a pool, you have a storage pool. Basically, you want to remove all of the disks and you want to migrate the storage to um, all new disks. It, that might be uh, a different size or different number. So like in this example, say I have 10 one terabyte drives and I want to replace them with four six terabyte drives. Um, there's some special cases where you could kind of hack, do this in a super hacky way uh, before this project, but this makes it a really first class. So, um, right, so what do we, how do we do this? That, that's what my talk is about. How do we do device removal? So all that we need to do is find all the allocated space in the storage pool, which is represented by these blue and purple squares, and um, then allocate new space for that in the remaining devices. In this case, I'm, I want to remove the device on the left here. So I, I'm going to allocate new space for the, the uh, uh, new, new places for the allocated space on this device. And then um, I need to read it from the old locations and write it to the new locations, and then keep track of uh, all the changes that I made. So like, so that I can find the data when I go to read it from a new place. Uh, yep, that's what I said. So uh, that's it. Um, now I'm going to tell you about, uh, no, OK, don't worry. I, I'm going to be getting into, it, it, like, if you're happy with that explanation, that's great. You can stay, you can pay attention for the next, like, five minutes and then go back to sleep. Um, but it, uh, if that wasn't quite convincing, <laughs> um, that, that's what the rest of my talk is about. Uh, but first, I wanted to kind of motivate that by showing um, how you actually use this and what it looks like, so that you can get an idea of um, what we need to be support, like what we need to be doing under the hood to make this all work. Um, so the way that you typically use device removal is uh, first you check to see if there's enough, uh, check to see how much memory will be used uh, after the removal. So as I mentioned, we need to keep track of the mappings from the old locations to the new locations. That uses memory. Um, 
So in this case, we want to remove this device uh, C2T1D0. We use the dash N for a no op flag. Uh, and then it'll tell us, great, after you remove this, we think it'll use 37 megabytes of memory. Then you just run it without the dash N and it kicks it off in the background. Uh, while it's running in the background, uh, you can check the status. It shows up in ZPool status. So it tells you like, oh, I'm in the middle of removing this device. And we also call it um, device evacuation to, to be really explicit about the fact that, hey, what I have to do to remove this is not like, oh, you run ZPool remove and then yank the device. You, you run ZPool remove and then we evacuate it by, you know, getting all of, the, all of the allocated data off of that device onto the other devices. Once the evacuation is done, then you can light the building on fire, but not before. Um, and then there's like a, you know, it tells you what rate we're, we're going and an approximation of how long, uh, how much longer you have, just similar to like a scrub. Uh, and if you want, you can cancel the removal. If you cancel it, we just kind of set everything back the way it was. Um, you know, this, you might want to do this if like, uh, you, you're, you're in the middle of removal, you start it on Friday night and then like it's, it's uh, Monday morning and, and you're like, oh, whoops, like this is taking longer than I thought. People are gonna be coming into work and they need really good performance. So let's cancel it and, and rethink what we're doing here. Um, if you lose power uh, or you reboot during your removal, uh, it'll pick up where it left off. So it, it, remembers, all the pro it remembers all the progress. Um, and you can do everything else while you're in the, in the middle of the removal. You know, you can, Add new devices, you can take snapshots, uh, everything. And then after you complete the removal, uh, the Zpool status tells you about that as well. And it tells you how much memory is used. Um, and this, this memory used applies to all device removals. So you can remove a device and then add another device and, add, and then remove another device. You can remove as many devices as you want until you get down to one device. And then you have to add some more before you can remove them. Okay, so uh, now, if you didn't buy my three-line explanation of how it works, this is how it really works in detail. So uh, if, if you want to follow al along uh, later, um, first thing, I'm going to be talking about uh, the removal process. And then uh, after that, I'll be talking about after removal has completed, what we need to do to handle the new state of things. Um, so this is mostly happening in vdev underscore removal dot uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of really huge comments in there explaining this stuff in more detail if you want to Check that out later. So uh, first I wanna mention, um, we, uh, we start by checking the removal type. So you've actually always been able to remove devices from a pool. Um, and so this, this IOCTL is not new. It's just that uh, most removals that you might wanna do will, re will result in eInval. Um, so first we check which, which type it is. So you've always been able to remove inactive hot spares, remove cache devices, remove log devices but this talk is about removing top level devices. So if you see that term in the code, like remove top, we're talking about removing a top level normal device from the pool and reducing the total amount of space and evacuating it, et cetera. So first we gotta start by doing a few checks. Um, first of all, you need to have enough free space because like I said, we need to allocate new locations for everything that's on that disk. Um, and uh, one, one little caveat that uh, we ran into when, when doing some uh, testing accidental testing is, um, so we require that you have like enough space plus a little bit. Um, the little bit that we decided on is, is based on the slop space in the pool. Uh, the slop space is just 3% of the total pool size, uh, but it's, it's the total current pool size. So what this means is that um, if you wanna remove a device, which on its own, that one device is more than 97% of the size of the pool, uh, you can't do it. Uh, because of this check, which w we could relax, um, but hopefully <laughs> you don't accidentally, like hopefully you aren't testing and want to add a one terabyte device, but accidentally add a one petabyte device. Um, yeah, that's how we discovered that. Uh, um, there, there can't be any known damage. Um, so this is just a, you know, kind of sanity check. Like um, if, you, if you're trying to remove a device and we know that the device is missing some data, we're not gonna let you do that. Um, and then lastly, uh, the blocks have to have the same on-disk layout. So what that means is that um, all the devices have to have the same A-shift, and unfortunately, you cannot have any RAID-Z. Um, I'll, I'll kind of get to some maybe future work there later, but um, for right now, it, does, it works with uh, plain disks, it works with mirrors, 
It does not work with RAID-Z. Okay, cool. So now that we've decided we're actually doing this device removal, we start by disabling allocations to the device. To, to the device. So um, we maybe won't have any rights to that device while we're, um, while we're in the middle of the removal. Um, and, uh, to make sh and then um, to hopefully make sure that we really, really don't have any rights to it, we do the SPA reset logs. Does any, anybody know what that means? What does this function do? No, excellent. Oh, two people know. Um, so uh, what SPA reset logs does is it um, re basically like clears all the ZIL logs and then reallocates them. The reason that we need to do this is because <clears throat> the, ZIL, uh, the ZIL is like a singly linked list of blocks. We've always allocated the next block that we're going to write to, but we don't know when we're going to need to write to it. So we've already allocated it. It might be allocated on the device that we want to remove. And we don't want to, uh, like in the middle of the removal, have to handle a write to the device that we're trying to remove. Um, so by resetting the logs, we make sure that they all get reallocated. Since we're doing it after we've disabled allocations to this, to this device, they'll all get allocated on the remaining devices, not the one that we're trying to remove. Um, and then we, we kick off a sync task. So sync task uh, is like a, a callback that runs from SPA sync while we're syncing out with TXG, and that's gonna initiate the removal. Um, so what that does is it initializes the on-disk state that says, we're in the middle of a removal. We have made zero progress. Um, and then it kicks off this new thread. So um, this is uh, pretty different than a lot of the other background operations. So uh, you know, if you think about what kinds of background operations you might normally see in SQL status, like scrub and resilver, um, those do not work by creating another thread. What, uh, they work by um, doing all of their work in syncing context. So when you're doing a scrub, basically like it does the normal writes, the, the spa sync does all of the normal writes, and then it's like, great, now there's like some time reserved for doing scrub. Um, and this is not really great for performance because it means that you're, you're basically taking uh, some overhead out of, um, out of your overall possible write throughput. Um, so we thought this was a, a, a lot better design to create a new thread to do this. And then the thread operates in the background, and, and, um, but it puts some design constraints because now the thread, the background thread, can do all the, it can do reads, it can do writes, it can do allocations, but we can't change any state in the MOS. So the, the MOS is the meta object set, MOS, um, and that's where we store all of the pool-wide metadata. Um, for example, how much progress we made for removal, or what is the mapping uh, between the old and the new locations. So we can't actually modify that from this thread. Um, so I'll, I'll get into how we do that later on. Okay, so we kicked out this new thread. What does the thread need to do? Uh, first, we need to start by finding the allocated space to copy. Um, so the interesting thing here is that we're doing this by looking at the space maps, not at the block pointers. So um, if you're familiar with Zpool Scrub or Resilver, those go through and find all the block pointers, that, which means they have to traverse the whole tree of indirect blocks and everything in the storage pool. Um, I don't know if anybody's noticed, but in some circumstances, the Scrub and Resilver don't have the best possible performance. Um, and uh, we, this is something that you might want to do, you know, when you're not in a disaster scenario. So we, we, wanted, we wanted to make sure that this is something that, um, well, it's already slow enough, so I'm glad that I did this. Um, we find this space by looking at the space map, and what that means is that we can find the allocated space uh, in order by offset on disk. So we're able to um, do the reads from the target device, um, starting from you know offset zero and then I increasing, and and but but also skipping over um, parts that aren't actually allocated. Uh, so yeah, fast discovery of the data to copy. We get sequential reads, but the caveat is um, there's no checksum verification. So the checksums are stored in the block pointers. We aren't finding all the block pointers. Instead, we're just finding what is actually allocated. So uh, we aren't able to verify the checksums during this. Um, and what that means is that uh, for the most part, everything works great. And I'll, I'll explain how this works with mirrors and data integrity uh, a little bit later on. But um, 
it, mean, it does mean that transient errors can become permanent errors, right? So like if I read from the device and it says, here's the data, we're like, we, get, we trust it, we write that to the new location. If it actually gave us the wrong data, then, well, I mean, most of the time it's like it gave us the wrong data, it's gonna keep giving it wrong forever. So like we didn't make things any worse, but there are um, occasionally the transient errors where the disk gives us, it says here's the data, but it's not the actual data. But um, if we asked again later, it might give us the actual data. Um, this is usually due to firmware bugs in, uh, in, in the storage hardware. Uh, okay, right, so we found the space, we allocate a new place for it, and we keep track of the mapping from the old to the new locations. Uh, I'll get into the mapping in a bit. Um, so in, in a little bit more detail, in order to find the allocated space, we're iterating over the meta slabs in the uh, device that we're trying to remove, uh, loading that meta slabs space map into um, a new range tree, this SVR Alex segs that tells us this is what we're working on copying right now. And then we find the next chunk to copy. So the simplest way and the first way that we did this was to just say like, find the next allocated region, however big that allocated region is, that's what we're copying. Um, but in order, uh, this could result in a large number of mappings um, and thus a large amount of memory used, uh, especially on very fragmented pools. So uh, we made a few tweaks to this. So uh, we have a limit, like you can't allocate more than um, 16 megs uh, or, or on Linux or, or one meg on Illumos and, and FreeBSD. Um, but uh, the other thing that we added is um, we can span across free segments that are less than or equal to 32K. And this provides a theoretically thousand X uh, less memory usage by your mapping because the mapping can be much, much smaller. Um, so in this example, I'm showing uh, like the, or the red blocks are allocated, the green blocks are, are free, and each one of these is like one, um, one uh, sector, one A-shift size, four kilobytes in this example. So here, um, each, of the free, uh, run, each of the runs of free blocks uh, or, or free um, uh, sectors is less than or equal to 32K. So I can actually allocate almost a whole 16 megs for this. So I'm kind of copy this whole almost 16 megs at a time. And you notice uh, I could have gone all the way to the whole 16 megs, but that would land me um, in between two allocated chunks. And I might not want to do that. I'll, I'll explain why that is there. So we go back to the end of the previous um, allocated chunk. So we're going to read this whole um, almost 16 megs. We're going to allocate a, a new almost 16 megs for it and then write that all to the new location, including the free space. So we're actually allocating space for these unused um, sectors and we're reading those unused sectors and then we're, we're writing them again. And the, the, uh, again, the reason to do this is to reduce the number of mappings. Um, and uh, the reason that we do, we, we could say, well, we know what's allocated and freed. So just issue the, like, sure, allocate the big chunk, but just do the reads for what's actually allocated and just do the writes for what's actually allocated. Um, but that actually tends to result in worse performance because uh, like making the disk skip over little bits um, re results in worse performance. Um, and this is actually one of the reasons that, uh, well, that, that's one reason. The other reason is just having a lot more ZIOs to deal with um, in the software level, uh, it has overheads. Um, and so actually at the VDEV Q layer, um, we're already aggregating reads across spans of up to 32K. So I could have issued a whole bunch of uh, reads for each little allocated bit, but then the layer below me, the VDEV Q layer, would have just said, oh, I noticed that you read things with like a little gap there. Let me just do one big read and then B copy out the parts that you want, um, which would have just been, you know, a lot, whole lot of work for nothing. Um, so instead I did it all at this layer. Uh, cool. So, uh, so why, oh, uh, sorry, what do I want to say here? Um, so, right, so why, I said that we could have allocated, we could have copied that whole 16 megs, but instead we're gonna do a little bit less. Why do we wanna do that? Well, the, the reason is that um, we want to minimize the amount of split blocks. Um, a split block is where there's, so I showed what's allocated and what's freed, but we don't actually know where the blocks are. So for example, we might have this whole 16 meg region is all allocated, but it's actually a bunch of, you know, 
20 kilobyte blocks next to each other. So from the like logical point of view, I have a whole bunch of 20 kilobyte blocks and they're all packed. They all happen to be allocated right next to each other, nice and contiguous. That's just what we want. Um, but from the space maps, we don't know that. We don't know where the block boundaries are. All that we know is, hey, the whole 16 plus megabytes is all allocated. I need to copy all of it. Great. Um, so here I've actually labeled the blocks uh, with, hopefully you can see that like slightly different shades of red to indicate where the logical block boundaries are. Um, so if we look at the end there, the A123 are three sectors that are part of one logical block. Um, if we went to the whole, if we went to exactly the 16 megs, uh, we would have to split that. And so like A1 and A2 would be part of the first mapping that we're copying right here. And then A3 would be part of the next one. Um, and that has some downsides uh, in terms of performance and some other things uh, that, that I'll get into more details later, um, which is why like in, in the top example, we go back to the end of the previous allocated uh, segment. But that isn't always possible, right? So like these split blocks, we want to avoid them when we can, but they're unavoidable in some cases, like the second case here where 16 plus megabytes are all allocated. Like, well, I don't know, we have this constraint that says you can't, copy more than 16 megs. So I guess I got to do exactly 16 megs and just hope for the best. Um, and the reason that we have the 16 meg constraint is um, because that's the biggest block uh, that ZFS can allocate. So in theory, we probably could have um, taught the allocator to be able to allocate bigger things. Uh, but in practice, we felt like, like A, 16 megs is big enough. Uh, and B, even though we could extend arbitrarily large, um, we know that we still do have to deal with the case where we can't allocate it because um, as we'll see later on, y you might, we might see a great 16 megs. Let me go allocate 16 megs, but there isn't 16 megs contiguous free space. And so we have to chunk it up smaller anyways. Uh, okay, right. So um, that's what, kind of what I said. We, we may have to chunk it up into smaller. Uh, we, if, if the allocation fails, we have to split it into two smaller allocations. Um, and then uh, what we do is we kind of learn from that. So for the rest of this transaction group, we won't try to go back to 16 megs every time and say, oh, great, 16 megs. Oh, that didn't work. Let me go to, ta to half of that. Oh, next allocation, 16 megs. Oh, that still didn't work. Surprise, surprise. Let me go back to the smaller one. That, that was very wasteful. Um, and also we wanted to make the back off um, go to the exact size available rather than exponential back off. So like it'll go to 16 megs. It'll try to allocate 16 megs. If that doesn't work, it'll split it in half. So eight megs and eight megs. But next time we'll try like 16 megs minus one sector. So we'll, we'll eventually find, okay, this is the actual largest segment that we can allocate in the pool on this TXG. And then, then we'll be able to go really quickly allocating those. Um, so this, is, this, is, this kind of algorithm is very important when um, your pool is actually fragmented and all, all the space is fragmented, not, um, and you don't ha have like, like if you just added a whole bunch of free, a whole bunch of empty disks, you don't have this problem. Uh, but we wanted this to work in all cases, not just uh, the ones that are easy. Okay, cool. So then we're gonna read from the old, we're gonna write to the new, and then we need to um, free the unused parts of the new location, right? Cause like in this first example, I'm, I'm allocating that whole 16 megs minus a little bit, which includes all those free bits, but nobody's using those free bits. Like there aren't any block pointers referring to them. That's the definition of being free. So uh, we need to free them from the new locations after we've done this. Uh, cool. So um, let me add one more wrinkle of complication to this before I explain the master strategy. Um, what if you have mirrors? So uh, if you are, if, if you have this example where like you have a pool, you, I'm trying to remove, I have three mirrors, each of two disks. I want to remove the one on the left. Um, there might be, uh, the mirror is healthy, right? Because we said we don't do removal while the mirror is unhealthy, but there might be um, uh, unknown damage. So there might be, there might've been some silent damage to one of the sides of the mirror. And we want to be able to, we want to be able to handle that in ZFS and, and we can uh, in all the other cases. So I was like, we should be able to handle it here too. So the way that we do that is um, 
rather than just reading, like, if, if, you, if we were to normally read the data from the mirror, we would say, great, you want to read it from the mirror? Let me choose, like, choose one side at random, and there's, there's the data, because the two sides of the mirror are the same, right? They're supposed to be, um, but they might not be, because we don't trust the hardware. Uh, so instead, what we do is um, we uh, read from both, we want to read from both sides of the mirror and write each side to the corresponding side of the, of the new location mirror. So in this example, like uh, the dark blue and purple uh, blocks were reading from the left side of the, of the removing device and we're writing them to the left side of the new locations. And then the light blue and purple were reading from the right side of the removing device and we're writing, writing them to the right side of the uh, new locations. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, so uh, again, keeping with the example of the two-way mirror, um, we create a ZIO tree. So this, this harks back to, hopefully you all were paying attention during George's talk, and you know by looking at this diagram exactly what will happen. Uh, which is that, um, you know, so this tree is showing the ZIO dependencies. So remember from George's talk, the uh, children have to complete before their parents. So in this case, what we're saying is the, we're, going to, we're going to issue these two reads that are the leaves of this tree. And when the reads complete, then we're going to issue the writes. And then when the writes, when both writes have completed, then this topmost null ZIO uh, is, is complete. Um, so here, you know, we have one like side of this for each side of the mirror that we're accessing. So the one on the left here is uh, reading from the left child, child zero, and then writing to the left child, child zero. The, on the right, uh, on the right here, we're reading from child one and then writing to child one of the new location. And then um, the null uh, uh, ZIO, that's the root of this whole thing, when that is done, then we know that the reads and the writes have all completed, and that's when we can uh, issue the freeze to the segments that are no longer needed, um, if, if there were any. Okay, so this is all happening from that open context thread that I mentioned. <clears throat> so, uh, right, so we're setting up, we're, we're, we're figuring out what the mappings are by allocating the new locations, but we can't actually like write that into the MOS because we're in open context. So what we're doing instead is accumulating a linked list of mappings. So. Uh, and then um, we arrange for every transaction group to do one sync task that will write out all the new mappings to disk. Um, and, and this is a pretty cool, uh, like this is not exactly how sync tasks were made to be used. Like if you look at all the other sync tasks, they're basically like, okay, I know what needs to be done. I just need to pass these arguments to this other function. Like I just need to like, I just need you to call this function from syncing context and pass these arguments to it. And I'm gonna be sitting here waiting for you until you do it. Like basically it's just a like context um, encapsulation mechanism. Like you could almost think of it as like, like if we had a more powerful programming language than C, you could just say like, here's, here's a block of code, just run this in this other context, right? Which is essentially what we're doing with the callback and the arguments and whatnot. But, but critically like the arguments are static through this whole process normally. But what we're doing here is we're kicking off the sync task, but we aren't waiting for it. And we kick it off and we give it the head of a linked list that, that we're then adding to. Like we're continuing to add to that linked list while like even though we already dispatched the, the sync task. Um, and uh, so there's, a, there's some trickiness here where we keep track, where we know like which transaction group um, the copy is going to complete in, and we make sure that we're adding it to that one. We know that it's open; it hasn't started, so that we know that we haven't started processing the sync task yet while we're modifying its linked list. Um, so this is like a little bit tricky, but uh, it actually worked out really well with the um, infrastructure that we had, and we found this paradigm to be uh, really useful in in like a bunch of other um, scenarios where you want to be doing something in the background from an open context thread and yet have it be modifying things that are stored in the MOS 
in syncing context. Uh, so we've repeated this. I think the um, the redacted send and receive stuff does this when you're creating the redaction list, um, and uh, a couple of other things do as well. Okay, the mapping. So um, right. So why do we need a mapping? Well, uh, as we mentioned, we are not finding all the block pointers. Uh, we're just finding the allocated space. So all those old block pointers still refer to the uh, removed or the device that we're trying to remove. Um, so when we get like when we get a ZIO read, it's going to say ZIO read device ID zero. Oh, that's gone. What do we do? Well, we need to know what the new, you know, we need to know where we should read from. So we keep this mapping. It maps from the, the old offset, the offset on the removed device um, and the length to the new device uh, and offset. And um, I'm, I'm showing it here as a table. This is, this is how it's represented on disk uh, and in memory. It's just like an array of structs, <clears throat> excuse me. And, uh, but but uh, critically, the, um, it's sorted by the old offsets. So uh, what that means is that when we want to go do a lookup in it, we can look up by just doing binary search because it's already sorted. Um, so we can look up in, in log and time. Um, and uh, because we're uh, generating the mapping by going through the space maps in offset order, we generate it in this sorted order naturally. So there's no like post-processing step in order to, that we need to do in order to sort it. Um, so like the sync task, all that it's doing is like, I have a linked, list, a linked list of like structs where e each row here is one of these structs. And then it's like, it's just says, great, take that struct, plop it into the um, object in the MOS uh, at the end, append it to that object in the MOS. Great. We're done copying. Um, we have everything in its new location. We know what the mapping is between the old and new, lo and new locations. Now we just finish up. Uh, we free the, the space maps of the device we're trying to remove because we don't need them anymore. There's some other little bits associated with the removing VDEV. We get rid of those. Um, and then we, we replace the VDEV. Um, like in this example, it's a mirror VDEV with two, uh, um, with two disk VDEVs as the leaves. Um, and we replace that whole thing with an indirect VDEV, which is a new VDEV type. Uh, OK. So I'm still OK on time. Good. Um, I wanted to uh, talk briefly about like how big is this mapping that you're talking about? How much I, I noticed you said you need to use some memory. How much of my memory are you going to be using? Well, um, in the best cases, we're able to do 16 meg mappings, um, which means that you only need, uh, well, the, so each, each uh, row in my table is 24 bytes. So that comes out to one and a half megabytes uh, per terabyte of uh, device that you are removing. So one and a half megabytes of memory will be used for every terabyte of, of removed device, uh, which, which is not too bad. Um, and this applies both in the case where like all of your allocations are super contiguous, which is the first example, and the ones where, uh, and the example where uh, your gaps are less than or equal to 32K, uh, which, uh, so, Iron maybe surprisingly, the, the, the first example here is 0% uh, fragmentation. The second example here is, is uh, high fragmentation, like more than 70% fragmentation. Both of those uh, work really well. Um, but the worst case uh, is the, the worst case possible would be where uh, we have a run of freeze that's just more than 32 kilobytes, and then we only have like one sector allocated in between it. So um, in this case, it could be really bad, 600 megabytes per um, terabyte of disk. No, this is um, terabyte of uh, like space in the disk, not allocated space. The allocated space would be much less. It would be one, you know, 131, uh, whatever, one eighth or whatever of that, um, because, you know, only one out of every 16 is actually allocated. Um, but the worst that we've actually seen in practice is about 100 megabytes per terabyte. Um, and this is, this is uh, with fragmentation that's between those. So less than 70% fragmentation, uh, but you know, more, more than, I think it's like more than 20%, um, which uh, we found that this is pretty, pretty tolerable. Um, it, it's actually, 
it has been much worse. So we originally um, didn't implement this gap skipping um, mechanism, and then it, it was it was a lot worse. That and uh, adding the gap skipping added, uh, gave us about 10x improvement in the worst case that we saw that we see in practice. Cool. So um, all right, so we talked about the main removal process, what that thread needs to do to do the removal, but what can happen when we're in the middle of the removal? Because remember, at the beginning when I explained like how you use this, I was like, ah, everything just works. You can do it, it runs in the background, you can do whatever you want while you're in the middle of it. Um, so what do we need to deal with? Um, okay, writes, nope, don't need to deal with those uh, because remember we, we kicked out all the zill blocks and we disabled allocations. Um, reads, uh, well reads actually just work fine because uh, we can just read them from the old location because it's still what it always was. Um, and, uh, you know, in theory, we could read some of them from the new locations, but for simplicity, we can just say, ah, just read it from the old location, it's fine. But what about freeze? Remember, we, we've allocated some, so, some, some of the space we've allocated new space for, but not all of it. So what if we need to do a free in the middle of a removal? Um, well, so first, we can free it from the old location. We know that is not needed anymore. Um, and then there's a couple of cases that we need to think about. It, we might be in one of these uh, three cases or more, as it turns out. Um, if we've already fully copied this, uh, this region of space, so we've already written the, the, we've already done the sync task that writes the mapping to disk um, and that's done, then uh, we need to also free the block from the new location because we have like the old location, the new location, new location is fully baked. We don't need either of those, so let's free them. If we haven't start, if we haven't started copying it yet, um, then we don't have a new location for it. Uh, but we want to make sure that we don't copy it. And remember, um, I, I I loaded the space map into this SVR alloc segs um, range tree, so I might need to remove it from there. I'm, I might not. It might be that like, you know, I'm in the middle of co of copying this meta slab, and I'm freeing something from over here. It's not in. It's not relevant to the SVR alloc segs, or maybe or I guess here, um, uh, in that case, fine, we ignore it. But it might be in that SVR Alex segs, which is telling us um, this is what we are, are going to be working on copying. We haven't started copying it yet, but we've figured out what we want to copy uh, from this meta slab. So we need to remove it from there. It might be in flight, meaning that we've issued the read. Uh, we, we, like, we've allocated a new place for it. We've issued the read for it but the mapping hasn't yet synced to disk and we might, the write might or might not have completed. In that case, um, we are going to need to free the new location, but we can't do it just yet. If we did it right away, then uh, that location might be reallocated before our write completes, in which case our write would stomp on whoever had allocated that out from under us. Um, so we, we remember that range uh, that needs to be freed in this um, SVR freeze, uh, uh, which is a, um, a range tree that we index by the transaction group. And then when that transaction group syncs, um, as part of that sync task that I mentioned, we're also going to uh, free everything that is in this range tree. Uh, and you might be in multiple or all of these categories because a free is like a range. It's like free this one megabyte. And um, we don't really know, like the, the thing that's, going in and copying stuff, like it's operating on whatever increments it wants. So it might be that of that megabyte, like a little bit of it, um, we haven't started copying. A little bit of it is in flight and a little bit of it is, is in flight in a different TXG. And then a little bit of it, it has been already fully copied. Um, so uh, the routine that does all of this is extensively, document, uh, extensively commented. <laughs> Um, cool, so uh, as you saw in the beginning, you can cancel the removal. We wanna put everything back the way it was. Um, so uh, what that means is we need to free uh, all of the new locations that we've allocated. Um, so uh, we cannot just go through the mapping and say, oh, like whatever the mapping points to, free that. Uh, for two reasons, one is um, the map, like the mapping could span free chunks. And two is we could have had those concurrent freeze happen. So uh, uh, like it was originally used, but now it's not allocated anymore. So if we, if we tried to free it, we might be freeing somebody else's stuff. 
So instead, uh, we go through the device that we're trying to remove. We go through its space maps again to find what's actually allocated on it now, and then look through the indirection table to tell us where we move that to, if anywhere, and if so, we free that. Okay, that's what happens while we're removing a device. And I still have some time, so that's good. Uh, because now I wanna talk about after the removal has completed, what do we need to do? How do we deal with it? So um, the first thing that you might need to deal with is opening your pool. Um, when you open the pool, the first thing that we do after like we read some stuff off of the labels, and then we go into the MOS and we read the MOS config object. This tells us about uh, like what, what devices are there? What are the devices IDs? Oh, it, this is like, there's some mirror, there's like a mirror, like VDIV ID zero is a mirror and it has two children and the two children are, you know, device ID X and Y. Um, so uh, that, that, everything to get to that cannot be on indirect VDEVs. Um, I should say, uh, all this stuff that I'm talking about is in vdev indirect.c. Um, as I mentioned, the device that we remove, uh, we call an indirect vdev afterwards. It doesn't show up in like Zipo list or the, interf the you know in the CLI interface anywhere, but under the covers, um, there's still like a vdev ID zero or whatever that you've removed. Um, like you remove vdev ID zero, but then afterwards you still have a vdev ID zero. It's just an indirect vdev, which handles all the mapping stuff. So, um, right, so the, the MOS config can't be on any indirect VDEVs because we don't have the mappings in memory yet. Um, so in order to make sure that is true, uh, whenever we do a removal, we make sure to dirty the entire MOS config object, uh, even the parts of it that we might not happen to be modifying uh, as like otherwise. And then we load the indirection table. Um, the representation of it on disk is the same as in memory, which is really nice. Uh, it's just this array sorted by offset. Uh, but the key, the, the tricky thing here is, what if I have removed multiple devices? Then, um, like the old, the, the, the first device that I removed, um, its indirection table might be on an indirect VDEV. So I need to load these in the right order so that by the time I get to that first one, I already have all the mappings that I need to load its mapping. Um, so we, re we have to load them in reverse chronological order, um, right, because older mapping objects may be on more recently removed indirect VDEVs. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, we've, we've opened the pool, everything's cool. Uh, now, what operations might we need to do that would interact with this indirect VDEV? Well, we might need to read from it. That's like the most common one. Um, when we read from an indirect VDEV, we go through the indirection table that tells us where we need to actually read from. Um, and uh, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, there's this function vdev indirect remap, uh, which uh, basically you give it a callback and it calls your callback on, on uh, telling it what the new location is or new locations are. Because remember, we might have split blocks, meaning the like one logical block, part of it we move to one location and part of it we move to another location. And it might not just be two locations, like I'm using in my examples, it might be like a thousand locations. Um, in practice, probably not a thousand, but like it could be more than two. Um, and so uh, we did some work to make sure that, uh, oh, oh, so you have the split. But then also, um, in addition to, it might be a split block, it might be multiply indirected. So like I might have, uh, if you think of, so I had to come up with all these, use, all these scenarios to test this. The, the, one of the hardest scenarios is like, I have two devices, I remove this one, and then that copies everything to here. And then I add it back as an empty device. And then I remove this one. So it has to copy everything over here. And then I add it back as an empty device. And then I remove this one. So like, I'm just migrating the data back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So every single thing in the whole pool is like indirected through as many indirect VDEVs as like I've done removal. So you can do this in the test case, the, the test suite has cases that do this where it just like, does this remove, 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 add, remove, add, remove, add, remove, add. And you can get like hundreds of um, layers of indirection. So um, we needed to implement this function uh, non-recursively. The, the, like the obvious way to do it is like, okay, great. I go through an indirect VDEV. It tells me here's the new location. And then the new location is some VDEV, right? It doesn't matter what kind of VDEV it is. Then I just 
do the read on that. But that one might also be indirect, and then that results in this, uh, could result in this recursion. So we, we made this VDEV indirect remap um, aware, uh, aware that it might point to another indirect VDEV. Oh, jeez. All right. I only have five minutes left, so we'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, uh, so, so we made this uh, actually work non-recursively with like an explicitly um, allocated stack of things to do. Okay, but in the common case where it's not a split block, then uh, we can just do a child I.O. To the, to the one new location, um, pass the checksum in, and then that child I.O. handles the data integrity. So like it might be a read from a mirror, the, just like the normal read from a mirror, it, has the, it knows the checksum, it can try both sides, it can take into account its DTLs and do its uh, you know, repair IOs and all that, easy. Um, but what if we're reading a split block? Then we don't, uh, so the issue is that we don't have sub block checksums. So like we, we have the checksum of the whole block, but half of it is he here and half of it is there when I issued the read for this half, I don't know what the checksum of that is. So I can't pass it down to the, 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 the child ZIO. So instead, we need to handle the integrity at the indirect VDEV level. Um, and this is kind of similar to what happens with RAID Z. Um, so uh, in that case, we're, we issue a child IO for each segment of the split. That's going to target the, um, the top level VDEV that it points to. So, that, so if that's a mirror, it's going to read from like you know some random healthy VDEV. And then um, we get them all, we stitch it back together, we verify the checksum, the checksum is good, um, and we say, great, now we have your data. We know we have your data. But what if you have split blocks and you're reading from an indirect, you're reading from an indirect VDEV, you have split blocks, and you have mirrors, and you have silent damage. So, you know, in this example, I said, oh, okay, we read from a, from a healthy leaf, and then we get the correct data, and the checksum is correct. But what if the checksum is not correct? Um, we want to, again, we still want to be able to handle the cases where like there's silent damage um, and the disk says here's the data and it's not actually the data. So in that case, what we need to do is we don't know which part of it is damaged. Like, right, we, we, we split it. In this case, I'm just showing two, but like it could be more splits, right? Like I could have five different parts of the split in five different locations and I don't know which of those five is actually has the damage. Um, so what I do is I, we need to read all the copies of all the splits and then try all the combinations of those copies. So what, what I mean here is like on the right there, I've shown um, like the, the dark colored ones are like the left copy and the light colored ones are the right copy. So like, let's say first I try both the both uh, left child, both left children and the, the actual damage, which I happen to magically know, is on both on the left child, which I've marked here with those red um, do not enter symbols. Um, so we, we, we verify, that we check the checksum, and it's like, nope, that's not the right data. So then I, I try, okay, well, what if I try the left? The first part of it is the left, and then the second part of it is I try the right side of the mirror, so the light purple there. Well, that's still not the right data. Okay, well, then let me, like, I'm kind of doing binary counting here, right? I'm like, adding one, so I flip the next bit. So now I'm doing the right part of the first mirror and the left part of the second mirror. Huh, still not the right data. Jeez, where is that data? So then finally I try the right side of both of the mirrors and find, aha, that's the correct data, finally. And then um, we can issue the repair rights to any segments that differ. So th this is also kind of unique and I think better than um, what we've done in a bunch of other cases like with RAID-Z. Um, uh, because we actually like compare, like we're gonna like B, uh, B comp the blocks and see like, okay, this one, like, cause you might have a three-way mirror, for example. And we, you know, we, we wanna figure out which one is right and which one is wrong. And we might not have gone through every possible combination, but we can check and see, okay, here's the right data. I know this is the right data and I have every other copy. Let me just see any of them that differ from the correct data. If, the, if they're different, then I'm gonna issue the repair, right? Um, in this example, I only have four different ways of doing it, uh, combinations to try, but um, you know, every additional split is exponentially more. So if I had three, if it was split three ways, then instead of four, it would be eight combinations. And um, if you have too many combinations, which uh, rarely, if ever happens in practice, but does happen when you're like running Z-test, um, then it might take like until the heat death of the universe to try them all. 
right? Because like, you know, two to the hundred is a big number. Um, <laughs> like counting from two to two to, to two to the one hundred is like takes forever. And then like doing you know doing like SHA two fifty six that many times is also not practical. So instead, we randomly select um, some of the combinations to try. Um, and hope that's good enough. And then um, on Linux, there's some um, extra tricks to reduce that search space to only the um, um, versions that actually differ, uh, which, which is a great improvement. We'll bring that to other platforms as well. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go a little over. <laughs> um, uh, I guess that's what you get to do if it's your conference. Um, <laughs> So uh, what if you get a write to an indirect VDEV? Uh, wait, wait a minute, what? Didn't we start out this by saying like, there, you are not writing, there's no writes. We, we made sure that the Zilla wasn't gonna write to it and whatnot, but it turns out you could get like a, a self heal write. So um, the most common case that you might see this is like, we discover that there's some bad data uh, via like a ditto block. So like you have a block pointer, it has two DVAs. Let's say one of them is concrete and one of them is, um, the, the indirect one, uh, we read for the indirect one and we, and we say, oh, like I tried all the combinations, like the data is just not here. And, but then we can, uh, the, like the layer above us in the ZIO chain is going to try reading it from the other uh, D, uh, DVA and, and maybe it finds, oh, I, this, this one, it's still good. So then we issue a repair, right, a, a, a self-healing right to the indirect VDEV um, and then we have to handle that. So. Uh, it's interesting that this happens, but it's also uh, super trivial to handle this. We just say, oh, well, like we go through the, the indirection table and, and write, you know, to the new location. Okay. Um, freeze from the indirect VDEV. Uh, so pretty simple. We just free it from the new location. But um, interesting thing is that now that means that some parts of the mapping are no longer needed, right? I freed that. The free, like by definition, means nobody's ever going to read that again. So that part of the mapping is no longer needed. We call that obsolete. So maybe we could reduce the memory used by the mapping table now that we know that some part of the mapping table is no longer relevant. Um, so we can do this by like tracking what parts of the mapping, uh, what parts, yeah, what parts of the mapping are, are obsolete and then condensing the mapping table to reduce its size uh, when, uh, when we have like an entire, when, when like one whole, entering the mapping table is all completely obsolete. Um, maybe, all right, I'm gonna fast forward. Um, so the caveat to all this is that uh, we implemented all this before we did the large mappings thing. And when you have the large mappings, this is much, much less um, necessary to, to do this managing the obsolescence to reduce the size of the mapping because the mapping is just much, much smaller to begin with. And because the mapping tends to cover uh, many, many blocks, like you have to wait till a lot of things get freed because you might have, you know, maybe it's not 16 megs, maybe it's like a one meg mapping that covers like 20 logical blocks. Um, you have to wait until all 20 of those logical blocks are freed or remapped um, until you can free, until you can get rid of that one entry, that one 24 byte entry in the mapping table. So, um, uh, because I'm running out of time, I'm only going to show you the cool pictures that I did because I spent a lot of time in them. Um, <laughs> and really, this is this is not so much to convince you of like, oh, this is super cool. It's more so that you like it, when you're going and looking at this code and you're like, what the heck is all this? Um, you can understand like the the high level of where it's coming from. So, um, right. So uh, there's what happens is when you do a free. Uh, we append that space to the obsolete space map that tells us everything that's been freed. And then uh, in the background, we do this condense operation that basically takes that obsolete space map and incorporates it into this um, obsolete size, which is not rendered correctly, but that's essentially like uh, to the side of the main mapping structure. We also have this piece of information that tells us like how much of that size is obsolete. If it gets to be the entire size, then we can, when we rewrite it, we can omit that entry. Ah, and then um, we can also say like when you're, whenever we write an indirect block, we can say 
hey, here's an, I'm writing this indirect block and it happens to have like kind of irrelevant to what, why I'm actually writing it. There's this other block pointer in here, which points to an indirect uh, VDEV. Maybe I can write that at, uh, maybe I can rewrite that indirect um, block pointer to point to the new concrete location, um, which maybe then I could now like mark that obsolete, but you can't if there's snapshots. So the snapshots might still reference it via the indirect uh, block pointer. So we have this new undisk structure called uh, remap deadlist, which keeps track of uh, DVAs that are um, uh, that are referenced in the snapshot, but then have been remapped. Um, and then when you delete a snapshot, you can find everything that uh, everything that has been remapped and is no longer part of any snapshot. And this algorithm is like almost exactly the same as regular deadlists. So a lot, a lot of places you'll see like, oh, like do the thing to the deadlist and do the thing to the remap deadlist. And if you want to know more about deadlists, then watch my other talk on uh, how how uh, snapshots work. You can also run this uh, new subcommand zfs remap, which will explicitly remap everything in that file system or zvault. Um, cool. So uh, thanks to so this is not a one person project. <laughs> Um, we've been working on this for many, many years, um, and a lot of other developers have helped us uh, with this, who are listed here. Um, and we've been using this in, in production in Delphix in our product uh, since 2015, and then uh, it's been in uh, uh, upstream in all the repos uh, since early this year. Uh, so future work, um, two really cool things that we'd like to do. One is being able to queue up multiple devices to be removed. The main point of this would be to mark them as uh, ineligible, ineligible for allocations and to do the space checking up front. Um, the big win here is that like when I'm removing a device, uh, rather than moving that space to all of the remaining devices, I'm going to move it to the ones which will be remaining after I've completed all the removals that I want to do right now. Um, I have a prototype, but it needs some work. The other really cool thing that we would like to do is to be able to remove a, a RAID Z group. Um, I think this is, uh, this is possible um, within this framework. Uh, if the other VDEVs are all also uh, similar RAID Zs. Um, but there's there's a couple of like pretty tricky gotchas about um, alignment and, and other things. Okay. Uh, can I have three questions? All right. I'll, I'll, I, <laughs> well, you can ask one question and then we'll, <laughs> we can talk later. So the, the indirect VDEV stays there forever. I mean, in theory, we could say like, oh, like once once that mapping table gets to zero size, we could remove it, but like there's no cost to it, so whatever. Right. That's what you use your one question on? All right. <laughs> yeah, so the question was, um, about uh, the spanning those those free segments and then the impact on SSDs, um, yeah. Like so, like when we're doing the copy, it's like good for SSDs, right? Because we're doing big chunks. But then, yeah, like we, when we do this freeze, um, uh, it's gonna do it's gonna do the trims if freeze do trims. So like if you're running on a platform or a config where freeze do trims, it will trim them because um, it's just a normal free. But uh, I, I will that, that reminds me that. There's a trade-off to be made here. Like before, when we were not doing um, uh, spanning the free chunks, uh, it meant that if you have a fragmented device and you do and you remove it, then all the free space gets compact, like everything gets compacted, and then your fragmentation like goes away. Versus with the spanning the free chunks, it it, pres it basically preserves your uh, fragmentation, um, which like is not great, um, but. Uh, like the memory and performance benefits are really, really huge. So if you need to, you can change that tunable, but hopefully you don't. Yes. You said that those work on 50 meg chunks. Uh, Up to, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, can that be 
No, so we, uh, the question was like, if I have more than 16 megs allocated contiguously, what happens? It's just gonna get chunked into 16 meg chunks. Um, we could up that tunable, uh, but uh, it might not be a great idea. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. And then you could consolidate it if they happen to be allocated contiguously as well, which is a corruption. Uh, the size field, 24 bits is way more than enough for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I see. So you, the question was basically like, what if I just have a regular, like a non-split block, just like a regular block? Um, could I do this combination thing? Yeah, you totally could. Um, if 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 basically if if what you're trying to protect it is like, I have a mirror, I have a block. It's like it's it's just a normal mirror, normal block, same thing on both sides. And what what the failure mode that I'm concerned with is like the beginning of the block got messed up on this side and the end of the block got messed up on this side, then I want to be able to stitch it all back together on a like sector by sector basis or like byte by byte basis. Yeah, I mean, you, you could totally do that. Um, I would not like, you would definitely need to do the random selection thing here um, to, to, in order to get it to complete before the heat death of the universe. Yeah, yeah, that 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 would that would be a big help help too. Yeah. You could call. You could just put some arbitrary limits like. Yeah. You know, if this is half the heat yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, uh, I, I, that thought definitely did occur to me um, to do something like that, uh, but it. That's a pretty unusual failure mode. M maybe if you're using 16 meg, like maybe if you're using um, record size equals 16 megs, it's not as unusual. But uh, it's like. In other cases, it's extremely unusual. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, you talked a lot about if you're moving mirrors and if you have other mirrors that you're moving data onto. Mm. Uh, what if you have different sway mirrors? Like if you're removing a mm. three-way mirror. Yep. Two yeah, so the question was like, what if my pool is not homogenous and I have like some three-way mirrors and some two-way mirrors? Um, in that case, we basically do the best that we can in that scenario. So like if you're removing a three-way and you only have two ways, we're just gonna read like two randomly selected children and then write those over here. Um, and if you're like, I'm removing a two way and I have a three way, well, like we're gonna, one of these is gonna get the same thing you know, copied twice. Yeah, but yeah, it does, it does handle that and does kind of as best as it can um, given the situation. Great question. All right, uh, I'm already like way, way over. So thank you all for indulging me. And this is my first full length uh, opens the FS presentation in six years. I've been organizing this conference for six years. This is my first um, full-length technical presentation. So thank you. Okay.